Well, part of Kate's um, many things, she's a, a, a real traveler, an international traveler, and you went to, in Vermont, the School of International yeah, School for International Trade. And she's done a lot of work at various times in her life in international settings. Well, as the case may be, um, we were sitting together trying to figure out the details of this. This was about 20 years ago and exactly what happened. But Kate was looking for me. She turned up in Kenya and, and she tracked me down. And, and uh, Part, and then part of it, at a certain point on that Africa trip, when she was in Nairobi, she was robbed. And so, yeah. <laughs> and um, very much um, the place where she was staying, it was a YWCA, I think, or whatever, and of course then didn't have any, any money at the time, and I took her to the house of the Marino sisters who welcomed her with open arms. And so she stayed with them for a few days. Um, <laughs> Okay. Anyway, Kate has also, I mean, she's a, she is a writer by profession. She's written, and besides the two books, she's written a number of articles, and, and she has spoken around the country uh, now on her, on this most recent book, which received in, 20, in 2017 a Christopher Award, and was also named by the Chicago Tribune in 2017 as what they consider the best spiritual book of the year. So without any further ado, Kate Hennessy. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all. Um, I am so grateful to be invited here. I'm so grateful that you've come to listen. I am so grateful to have heard uh, from people that I have known all my life and love. You know, Pat and Kathleen knew my grandmother. They knew my mother. Now me, three generations, Robert Ellsberg, the same. Um, you know, to, to meet Jackie, I had never met her before, but we are Facebook friends. Um, also, um, Amanda, you know, um, I've known her since she's been at the Catholic Worker, though I never get to talk to her because she's always so busy. <laughs> you know, um, Stanley Wisniewski, Wisniewski used to speak about the uh, workers and the scholars. And there's a, um, a great Catholic worker tradition that you either have the workers or you have the scholars. And uh, never the two shall meet. And um, I have come down on the side of the scholars. So while Amanda is working hard, I'm trying to get her to talk. And uh, it can't be done. It just can't be done. She is always on the run. But, um, you know, it's really hard for me to follow up these wonderful stories because Every single one of you has touched upon something that is dear to my heart. Um, starting off with the film, it's extraordinary to hear my grandmother's voice. It's extraordinary to hear my mother's voice. Well, you know, they're both gone. My mother died in 2008, a year after that film came out. Um, to hear my grandmother's voice, I mean, she was a storyteller. And I just want to warn you, I don't ever prepare for these talks, so I could really go off the rails. <laughs> but I blame my grandmother for this. <laughs> she used to give these long, she's a storyteller, and that's what I, one of the things that I remember the most about her. She was a wonderful storyteller. She loved people. She loved people's stories. She could get people's stories out of them so easily, and that was one thing that, that really struck my mother that um, whoever came in, there'd be some just fascinating people who would come in on the soup line, and my grandmother would sit them down and say, you know, who are you, where are you from, what's your story? And they would be delighted. And I think that that is one of the, um, the treasures that she has given to me, that is that we can do so much for each other by sitting down and listening to each other's stories. And I think that my, my grandmother has touched more people that way. Than, than we can imagine. So one of the things that um, in, in um, I'm going to, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to do today, I just want to talk a bit about how I came to write this book, um, what it means to me to be Dorothy Day's granddaughter, what it, what it has done to me. Um, I have this list of lessons, and I call them 
for lessons I learned from my granny that have ruined my life forever. <laughs> so I'll talk a bit about that. I'll read from my book a, a bit, and then I'd like to open it up for, for um, questions, because that, to me, is the most exciting part of speaking about my granny and my mom. You know, I, I absolutely love speaking about them. I mean, they, they are mighty people, absolutely mighty. And another thing that really struck me in watching the film and in listening to people talk is that those of us who knew her still miss her every single day. And I'm sorry, Coral. Um, and also, to, to be able to hear her is such a blessing. Marquette University has a, an archive of the Catholic worker and my grandmother, and in their archives they have a collection of recordings and of my grandmother's talks in the 60s and the 70s. And I feel so lucky to be able to listen to those talks, and I highly recommend listening to them. The, the recordings are not that good, um, and sometimes they're just recorded on a little, you know, those old-style cassette players in a noisy room. But it's still worth it. And also, getting back to this, um, you know, this genetic aspect of me kind of wandering on in my storytelling, one of the things that, and I know, and I know it's genetic, because um, one of the things that she says in, in, in one of these talks is that someone asked her, well, how many, you know, how many of the men who come to the soup line uh, then become involved with the political work, the social work, the justice work? And instead of answering the question, she goes on into this long story about how one man on the soup line attacked another with a knife. And then she goes on to talk about Alice, who, who I knew, would, how she couldn't sleep at night. She was, Alice was an incredibly hard worker. She couldn't sleep at night. You could find her in the kitchen every night smoking a cigarette. Um, so then the guy says, why are you telling us this? You know, you're not answering my question. And my grandmother says in her, uh, very, it's hard to describe her voice, but uh, she could put you in your place pretty quickly. <laughs> she said, allow me to be discursive. <laughs> <laughs> so, please allow me to be discursive. <laughs> and if I go off topic, just kind of maybe try to remind me. Um, but also, she knew, I mean, there was a reason why she was discursive. And that one reason was, there were men in the room, in the audience at that time, who had come in for, for help. And she wasn't going to talk about that, you know. Um, and so she told us this great story about, you know, Alice and, um, Alice was wonderful. Now, I'm going to be discursive, again. <laughs> Alice was wonderful. And one of the things, one of Alice's um, claim to fame is that, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a poet named Max Bodenheim. He was actually extremely well known, and he ended up dying a tragic death. But um, before he died, uh, he had known my grandmother since the 19, 1917, I think. He was from the old crowd in the um, Greenwich Village time. And so he had kind of come into my grandmother's life several times throughout, throughout um, his life. And uh, he had to come to the worker because he had broken his leg and he was destitute, he and his wife. And uh, during that time, he wrote poetry about people at the Catholic Worker. And Alice was one of those people that he wrote this beautiful, sweet little poem about, which of course I can't remember. But, um, and I have no idea why I told you that story. <laughs> but I think why I told you it is that um, one of the things about the Catholic Worker, which is very hard to imagine, is the, the incredible sense of family, the idea of what family is, a reimagining of what family is. And all of these characters were part of our family. I grew up hearing the names of people that I, I had never met, and they had died decades before I was born. And yet they were all spoken of and talked about and stories told about them that made it seem like they had just gone out to buy a, 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 you know, a carton of milk and would be back anytime soon. And it wasn't until I was in my teens that I realized, 
oh my god, these people had died in 1945, you know. Um, but that was the sense of, the incredible sense of the Catholic worker, and that was what my mother grew up in, and then I also was privileged to grow up in, though I did grow up in Vermont. Um, but I did grow up uh, spending our summers at the Tivoli Farm, upstate New York. And um, to me, the Tivoli Farm was just magical. I mean, it was magical. Of course, as a child, the Tivoli Farm opened in 1964, and my mother immediately packed us all up. There's nine of us, and she usually had very, um, you know, clunkers of a car and very small. You know, it's usually like a, a Volkswagen Bug or a, or a Corvair. If anyone of you remember Corvairs, and there are nine of us. <laughs> Good thing we were all skinny back then. She, would pile, she piled us all into that car and drove immediately down to the Tivoli Farm. It had been open maybe 10 days. And um, she wanted us to experience what she had experienced as a child growing up in the worker, growing up in this incredible, incredible community, growing up in this huge extended family. You know, she had a lot of aunties and uncles and the Catholic worker, even though she herself was a single child. So I, we spent probably from 1964, when I was four, uh, up until about 1975, um, every single moment we could at the Catholic worker at Tivoli. And also, you know, Deirdre and Tommy, uh, my oldest sister Mary, was their babysitter. So, so I remember Deirdre and Tommy when they were really, really, really little. <laughs> but um, so multi-generational. I mean, it really is extraordinary how it keeps going on. And another thing that has come up is that, um, you know, how many people have been affected. I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me during these talks and said to me, I met your grandmother once when I was 18 years old. I haven't forgotten her since. <laughs> and then I said that, you know, because uh, I like saying that because I see, as I'm seeing it here, I'm seeing people nod their head in recognition of, of that kind of power. And um, I said that once, told that story, and this guy comes up afterwards and he says, I can't believe what you said. I was 18. I met your grandmother once. My life hasn't been the same since. <laughs> So, and I love hearing hearing stories. So I'm hoping that you know when I finish my um, spiel, that that people will share with with um, some of their stories. You know, you can't. So, sometimes people have come up to me and said, "We admire your grandmother so much." And I'm like looking at them and I'm saying, I'm thinking, cause I'm much too polite. I'm thinking you're not paying attention. You are not paying attention. You cannot simply admire her. If you start reading what she wrote, if you start paying attention to what the Catholic worker is, your life is going to be blown out of the water. And I am no exception. I mean, I grew up in the worker. It was what I knew. Um, I also, as I mentioned, grew up in Vermont, which, you know, my mother had her own uh, house of hospitality on the land in Vermont. Um, in her own way, and a lot of the, the folks from, from the New York Catholic work would come up and spend, spend time with us, and our neighbors didn't quite understand it. You know, they kind of referred to it as that riffraff from New York. <laughs> but it was such an integral part of my life. Um, and then as I started, I mean, but it was the way things were. I mean, you know, I, I knew that my grandmother was a public figure. She spoke a lot. Um, I knew she was famous. I knew that, um, you know, she spent a lot of time on the road traveling. Um, but she also visited us a lot. She was very present in, in, in our childhoods. She was, um, she was at every single birth of my siblings, except for me. And that's my fault, because I came too early. Um, <laughs> She, she talked, she and my mother talked at least um, once a week, if not more, um, very close. My mother and grandmother were incredibly close. And uh, this has been something that has been really important for me to speak about because I think there's a lot of discussion. How can a person be as public and as driven and working as hard as my grandmother also be a good mother or a good grandmother? 
and I want to tell you <laughs> that there has probably that the relationship, the love between my mother and my grandmother, is the strongest relationship I have ever had the pleasure, uh, the the honor of witnessing. Mm -hmm. And it also was difficult. It was difficult to see that love. Um, you know, as a child, you want to be the center of your mother's universe, don't you? <laughs> but yet, the, the other miraculous thing about both of them, both Tamar and Dorothy, is that you never felt a lack of love from them. That there was no end to it. Absolutely no end to it. And um, that is an extraordinary lesson. But, on the other hand, it is very, very hard. Getting back to the notion that, that, that if you admire my grandmother, you're not paying attention. And um, if you are paying attention, you'll be blown out of the water. Is that that happened to me. As I became more and more aware of who she was and what her work was. You know, as a teenager, you're really trying to find yourself. And you're seeing this, this um, incredible woman. It is so hard to describe, and a bit of it, I can't remember who said in the movie, but the, maybe it was you, Pat, of the, the, what happened when my grandmother walked into a room. She was an incredibly powerful person, and this is very hard to describe. And one of the reasons why I think this is hard to describe is that we don't often describe powerful women. And she was a powerful woman. You know, there was no doubt about that, and it didn't have to do, I mean, she was very beautiful, and she was exquisitely beautiful as a very you know, elderly woman. You know, there, there came a time when she just she was just becoming more and more beautiful as she aged, but as a young woman, she was, you know, devastatingly beautiful. So there is that element, but that's just one small element. And she also was very tall. I think she was about five foot 10. Um, so she had a physical presence. When she walked into her room, there was this, this profound physical presence. But there's also these other elements of, I think, power that we don't talk about. We don't really understand. It's not economic power. It's not political power. It's not celebrity power. And she had no patience for being treated like a celebrity. Absolutely no patience at all. So there's this, this element that I think I would, I would love to be able to, to, um, to speak of, but I still don't have the words. What is that power? Power of you know, authenticity. What you saw was what you got. And that could be harsh. Uh, and that could be incredibly loving. Um, I never experienced her harshness, but certainly my older sisters did. Um, you know, she had very strong views. And my sisters were growing up in the 60s. So, <laughs> it was, it was, there was a little clash you know, there. Um, so I just, you know, to, to grow up with this has been very hard. To grow up trying to figure out my way um, in view of this, this path, you know, that she has laid before us all. It took me a long time to figure out how to find my own way in the world. Now, this is still ongoing. I cannot give you any definitive answers. But I would like to share with you some of the things that, that have guided me, um, you know, those, those lessons of my granny that, that ruined my life, but have also made me everything that, that I most cherish about my life. You know, one of the things that took me years to find out is that she didn't say that we all had to go out and open up a house of hospitality. She didn't say that we all had to go out and start a soup line. But I didn't hear that for a long, long time. And, you know, the thing about uh, my family is that, you know, my grandmother isn't the only one that I've inherited genes from. You know, I've inherited genes from my grandfather, Foster Batram. And I just want to say that that's actually how you pronounce his name. Sorry, everyone who's been pronouncing it wrong, but it's Foster Batram. So not Forster Batterham. He comes from an English family, and, and they were very precise about the pronunciation of that name. <laughs> but he was very different from Dorothy. He was, he was a hermit. He only lived in New York City because of love of his family. 
and friends. Um, but he was he was a biologist. He was a trained biologist. He absolutely loved the natural world, and it was he who taught Dorothy about the natural world. And I'll speak a little bit more about um, about her connection to the natural world, which which uh, often goes unnoticed in her work because it's uh, you know everything is so fabulous about her that these quiet elements that, that spoke to me a lot have kind of gone unnoticed but he um, you know he preferred to be out in the middle of the, the the sea in a boat you know fishing and pretty much every single one in my family is exactly like that <clears throat> um, except for my sister Martha uh, Martha has really taken on the uh, the role of um, well to put it Simply, she's taken on the role of getting arrested in the family. <laughs> so, and one of the recent things that she has done is she's one of the um, Plowshare Seven of uh, Kings Bay Seven, along with uh, six others, including Liz McAllister, um, Father Steve Kelly, Patrick O'Neill. Um, O'Neill. I knew it was an Irish name. <laughs> I was just thinking O'Reilly. No, that's not it. <laughs> O'Neill, Patrick, um, Mark. Um, again, blank. Coville, Mark Coville, um, Claire, great. Um, and they just had their trial last month, October, and they're all found guilty. Um, I don't know, you know, if you're familiar with what happened, but they went down to the Kings Bay um, Naval Base where there are Trident submarines and um, trespassed and, and poured blood and, um, you know, made their presence known, had to hang around a bit to make their presence known, but. Um, then were arrested, and they were found guilty on all counts after a very short trial. I think it was like two hours. So they're now all waiting for um, sentencing, which should happen in, in either January or maybe to February, um, which you know we're all kind of in denial about. My sister Martha is older than me. She's a grandmother. Um, she's a gardener. You know, she's a very talented person. But she's driven, like my grandmother. My grandmother was driven, and so was Martha. It's kind of interesting, actually, to see, to look at all of my siblings. And we all seem to have, have inherited one aspect or another of my grandmother. And I think one of the things that I've inherited from her is absolute love for, um, for writing. It used to be love for travel, but I'm kind of losing my, my game when it comes to traveling. But, um, but those are the two things that I really, I really, um, picked up almost immediately. I mean, the first time, I cannot tell you the impact, the first time I saw my grandmother typing. Now, um, it was a brilliant uh, uh, image uh, of her typing. She was a wicked typer, type, typist, and, and very fast, and you know, um, it was extraordinary. And I started, at first, you know, I didn't know what she was doing. Um, so then I thought, well, maybe it's the typewriter, so I wanted to learn how to type. <laughs> Uh, and then I realized that, no, actually, I mean, I was seven years old, what did I know? But, um, but really, seeing her writing and being told by my mother, you know, I was like, what's she doing? And um, my mother who actually very rarely told me to do anything. You know, she'd actually, I'd come running into my grandmother's room, this was at Tivoli, and, um, you know, shopping, whatever. And my mother, who just rarely ever told me to do anything, my mother believed in um, benign neglect raising children. That, that may be because she had nine kids. <laughs> Probably because she had nine kids. But anyway, she said, shh, shh. And I like stopped. I've never, she had never quieted me down, ever. And I don't think she really had to. Uh, we were all a pretty quiet bunch. But um, she said, Granny's writing. And I'm like, writing? What's that? And I was just beginning, you know, to, uh, I love stories. My sisters would read me stories. Um, and I was just beginning to, to learn how to write and read, and bam, that started me off on, on a, uh, my life's vocation, <coughs> my vocation. And um, it's not just my grandmother, it's actually it's on both sides of the family. There's a lot of writers in my family. So I think now, you know, Martha's vocation is, as I say, getting arrested. <laughs> but um, anyway, I just, I'm gonna go into these, um, uh, these lessons that I've learned. And, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned that I thought I had to, I thought I had to follow my grandmother's footsteps. And it took me a long, long time to realize that she never was asking that of me. 
And um, I just recently, re uh, I think, listened to an interview of her. It may have been in a movie. I kind of forget where I see things. It may have been in a movie about um, uh, Dom Helder camera, perhaps. Uh, it was a <laughs> 70s movie, and she was interviewed. And um, she tells a story of Eunice Kennedy Shriver coming to visit with two of her kids. I'd love to know which two of her kids. Uh, coming to visit my grandmother, and she asked my grandmother something along the lines of, you know, do you do you hate rich people? And you know, of course, Dorothy said no. And then she said something that really has great meaning to me, and that is, we all have to go as far as we can. We all have to do what we can, not, and that may just be something very little, very simple. Um, that we're all, and she had said earlier, um, or in her writings, you know, um, we all have to follow our own way. We have to find our own way. And this has been a, um, a task, you know, that I have definitely had, have had to take on. I've had no choice. Um, you know, she makes me examine myself all the time. So the first thing that I want to say that um, these lessons that have ruined me forever, um, the first one is make yourself uncomfortable. Really push your boundaries. Um, and this enc encompasses many of her, the, the topics of the day that, that um, you know, the, the issue of poverty, whether it's voluntary or not voluntary but particularly voluntary poverty, choosing to live a poor life, uh, the, the issues of nonviolence and pacifism, and what that asks of us as individuals, um, the, the call to do the works of mercy, what does that ask of me? You know, what are the things that push my, my buttons or ex make me uncomfortable? And um, because I don't have all day, I won't go through these, these things. But each of these, you know, voluntary poverty, <coughs> pacifism, works of mercy, these have all had direct consequences in my family and growing up. We lived these things. We could not avoid them. The second thing is follow your conscience. Um, this one is incredible. Um, each of these are amazing, but to follow your conscience, that really, really speaks to me, still speaks to me, and probably will always speak to me. And it's not so easy. How do we know what our conscience is telling us? Um, we have to be awake, I think, to know. We have to listen to that little voice, that, that voice that, that will not let go of us. Um, and it may lead to a completely different direction than we thought. Um, and she was very funny. She said, well, it's, it's good to have an informed conscience, you know, read, speak, you know, really think about that. But she, has, has, she said, it's not essential. You can follow your uninformed conscience. <laughs> That's, you know, that there is something sacred about that voice um, and that we have, to, we have to be awake to it. We have to listen and then we have to follow it. The third thing is find your vocation. Now, unfortunately, Pat stole my favorite line, but I'll just repeat it. Um, she said, you'll find your vocation by the joy it brings you. And, you know, she's not talking, and my mother, for both of them, vocation was an incredibly important point. And, um, and I think for my mother, because she wasn't able to, to really follow her vocation, becoming a, a mother at the age of 19 and, and having nine children, but, um, it was so important to the two of them, and it's really important. And this is what I like to, I talk about this with a lot of college students. And, and I have the feeling, I'm pretty sure, that no one ever talks to them about vocation. They talk to them about career. And uh, this is not the same thing. And you'll probably, if you follow your vocation, you will probably not earn any money. <laughs> there are some people who are very lucky, who can do that. Um, but you know, Peter Morin said that uh, if you really want to look at that kind of following, that kind of, of, of voice in yourself, you know, look at musicians, look at artists, look at writers. You know, they are following their vocation and they are making huge sacrifices for that. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, another thing, um, don't be afraid. She talked a lot about fear and how fear keeps us from doing the things that we know we need to do. She talked a lot about bodily fear. She said there's so many different kinds of fear. You know, she was, um, I think in the, in the movie, talked about when she was shot at, shot at, at Koinonia, Georgia. She said that when she went down to the South to support people in the civil rights movement, she said the terror there, the fear there, was so profound, so profound. Um, and people had to go ahead anyway. I mean, the violence that was happening down there was incredible. And it was not in the news. You know, um, and, and she said, you know, the fear is, will take you over. And she says it can be very visceral. It can really stop you physically. She says, don't be afraid. That was the last thing on her mind. Her last um, public speaking was at the Eucharistic Congress in 1976. And um, that was, I don't, I don't, I can't remember what she spoke about at, at the conference of the uh, Congress, but she was thinking about, in preparation for it, the thing that was most on her mind was, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The next one is one that's also very dear. Well, these are all dear to my heart. <laughs> um, she said, find beauty no matter where. You know, we've talked, a lot of people have brought up the idea of beauty. And I mean, look, we are this, surrounded by beauty right now. I named my book, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty. It was one of her favorite, favorite uh, sayings up until she died. And um, it just really struck a note with me. And um, I, I just want to, I just had to actually share with you a recent um, revelation is that, um, and this is, I think, Julian Norwich speaking to me. The world has already been saved by beauty. We just aren't seeing it. And I think the, the logical outcome of this is that we are indeed destroying the planet. And um, this brings up something that, uh, so many elements that uh, I, I am grateful for. I learned the deep sacramentality of the land from my mother and my grandmother. And it came through Staten Island, actually. You know, my mother uh, was conceived and uh, raised on Staten Island, so she learned how to walk. My grandmother had her conversion on Staten Island. Um, they both absolutely loved Staten Island. And Staten Island is an abused, abused land, landscape. And um, certainly in their lifetimes, they, they watched it just become, well, it, it, it held the largest man-made structure in, in the world, the Great Kills garbage dump. Um, along many other things. Um, so it's, and I'm so sorry Pat and Kathleen because Pat and Kathleen lived on Staten Island for many, many years. <laughs> but it was hard for me. I come from Vermont. Vermont is beautiful. There is no doubt about it. People come from all over the world to, to see the beauty of Vermont. And so I come down to Staten Island to visit my grandmother in the last years of her life. And she, she spent two summers there and my mother would come down and I and I you know and I knew how much they both loved Staten Island, and I'd arrive and I'd say, "What are they thinking? What are they talking about? What is so beautiful about Staten Island?" And it took me a long time to realize they never forgot the integrity of that land, of that landscape. You know, one of my favorite favorite writings of my grandmother, and um, I consider her a nature writer. Uh, she writes about nature, maybe not as from the point of view of a biologist, definitely not from the point of view of a biologist. She often got the names of things wrong. But um, she loved it so deeply, and I absolutely, you know, it's just a simple, clear writing about the natural world around her. And there's two things that always struck me about her. One is that um, she used to bless the trees as she walked down, you know, 3rd Street or 2nd Avenue. Um, you know, it, it was to her, trees were holy. And also, water was holy. All water was holy to her. And I loved her kind of explanation of it. She said, well, Jesus was baptized in water. And then she said, and there is no time with God, so, you know, the water has always been holy. 
you know, <laughs> I'm not concerned about, you know, chronological time. Um, you know, and, and so this, this has been um, this, and also, you know, what, what people have spoken before, Kathleen, of, of how any, any little thing that she could see that, that she found beautiful, she would notice, she would see. And I think that that is, you know, there's so much we need to do with trying to protect our sacred landscape, and it feels overwhelming. But I think the very first thing that I think that we need to do, and I think she teaches us this, is to change our perception of what is out there and to feel love for it. We have to feel love for this land or we won't get it together to save it. And I think we have become deeply, deeply divided, separated from our landscape. Next thing, well, this kind of moves into the next thing and that is love. Um, I cannot tell you how crucial love is. <laughs> Um, this book is absolutely a labor of love, and it does not make anything easier to feel such love, but it will save your life. Um, you know, my grandmother said that, that there's nothing else to write about except love. And um, that also ties into what I mentioned earlier about their, both my mother and my grandmother's expanding concept of family, of who we are. Um, that family isn't just a very closed, um, you know, who we're related to, but it is, it is a huge, never-ending family. And, uh, and how I also mentioned how I, I learned that I, could, I had my mother's love, no doubt about it, but I also could see how she had a great deal of love for her mother and a great deal of love, of love for many, many people. There was no end to it. She never ran out of love. And neither did my grandmother. She never ran out of love. Um, and she loved deeply, and she loved tragically, and she loved in all the ways that we do, all the foolish ways. But she also loved in all the wondrous ways. And that also ties into paying attention to each other. You know, as I, you know, this, this ability of hers to elicit stories, our stories, you know, um, storytelling, I think, was her one of her major ways of knowing one another, of learning about one another, and loving one another. And that also came up in Jackie's movie, We Don't Know What We Do. We don't know how we destroy people until we know them, until we know their stories, and then suddenly we really can make that human connection. We're very good at not making that human connection, and it takes an effort. And it meant expect failure. She felt she was a failure. At the end of her life, she really despaired at it seem, it's that seemingly endless work that she was involved in, and she felt she had failed. But then she said, well, oh well, you can only expect failure. I mean, you know, Christ on the cross was a failure. Um, but yet, is he? Was it? You know, but I think this is a valid point, a really valid point. We have to expect failure. We will fail um, many, many times. And this is something that, I mean, certainly as Americans, we are not taught that that is good and that is a goal. You know, it's success. We were taught to be successful. And she's saying, no, expect failure. Don't give up and expect failure. Two more things. She also taught me to laugh. A lot, um, and that was mentioned earlier. She had a fabulous laugh, and this was something that my mother kind of um, sorrowed over: is that she felt that that aspect of her mother was being forgotten. That my grandmother had a very finely tuned sense of humor. She loved to see the absurd. Um, she she had a quick wit. Um, and she had this wonderful laughter, and it was kind of like a girlish laughter, you know, it was kind of like a giggle, but it was, it was just wholehearted and full, and, um, and I heard it often growing up, and, you know, it was the same laughter that I heard from my mother. And my mother and she did look a lot alike. They had similar aspects, and one of the things, similar things, in addition to, this is kind of like the other side of the coin, the laughter, they had what my mother called the look 
Uh, my grandmother had very piercing blue eyes, and my mother often experienced what she called the look when she was doing something that my grandmother didn't approve of. Now, the, the uh, funny thing is, the additionally funny thing is, is that my mother, who also had these piercing blue eyes, had the look. I've seen it. So, very powerful. You don't need to say anything. When you have the look, you don't need to say a word. And then the last thing I'd like to add to this um, is pray a lot, unceasingly. And um, this, uh, this was, again, something that I had to really grow into. Um, and one of the things that has really been helpful for me is that uh, my grandmother thought of prayer as a very wide and varied act that there isn't just one way to pray, that there are many ways to pray. And it could be in uh, writing. She said that writing, often for her, was a form of prayer. Mm -hmm. Listening to music was a form of prayer. Um, you know, reading scripture, of course, form of prayer. Um, you know, the, the um, official prayers. It was, it was just this wide variety of prayer. And, um, but you do it unceasingly. <laughs> and I think this is, I mean, this is so hard to pinpoint, you know, why is prayer so important? And I think that's the element that brings us all beyond, you know, our own small world, that we don't understand everything, we don't see everything, and we have to place ourselves in someone who actually does, whoever that is, who, however we see God, however we see the divine. <laughs> Um, and, and you need that strength, you need that strength for this work because you're not going to get support from any other way, <laughs> you know, from each other, of course, but you're also going to be tried by each other, too. So those are the things that I've been learning, that I've been struggling with, and I'm sure, you know, people have other things that they can add to that, and I'm sure I will change this as I, as I grow older and, keep thinking. You never stop learning from my grandmother. You never stop learning. So with that, I just want to read a few bits and then we can, we can open it up for questions. Now I wrote this book, and I just realized I didn't, I promised to tell you about how this book came to be, and I haven't. <coughs> um, if I'm talking too much, just tell me. <laughs> Wrap it up, Kate. Um, I'll, I'll briefly go over this. Um, my mother and I, since my grandmother died in 1980, spent a lot of time talking about Dorothy. A lot of time. Well, she spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time listening. She really needed to work through a lot of, of her experience. And um, we spent 27 years talking about Dorothy until the death of my mom in 2008. Now, during this time, I kept saying to her, you have to write the story. You have to write the story, Mom. And she would say, oh, no, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And, um, and so, you know, years would pass. And I, would just say, I would just think, I just need to be patient. She'll eventually do it. And I'll bring it up again. Write your story. And she'd say no. So finally, I said to her, well, if you're not going to write it, I'm going to write it. And you know, to explain, I mentioned earlier that my, my, my mother believed in the, uh, the uh, how child raising, you know, method of, of benign neglect. And that she very rarely told me what to do. Well, when I said I was going to write this book, the very first word out of her mouth was, words were, um, no, you are not going to write this book. So I was like, okay, mom, I won't write the book. I didn't want to go against her wishes. And I don't really know. To this day, I don't really know why she said that. Um, I suspect two things, but I don't know this for certain. One is she felt that the story was too painful. And it is, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, it is hard, hard. It's a hard story. You know, family life is full of tragedy, and our family is no different. Um, you know, we, we grew up in extraordinary circumstances, but basically the fundamental, you know, ways in which family torture each other are there. Um, you know, and disease, death, you know, everything is, is there. 
Um, so I thought I thought she just felt this was too too difficult to write about. And then the other reason why I thought so is because she was always always disappointed in how people wrote about the worker and about her grandmother. She said, you know, she adored the worker. She grew up in it. She she loved it. It was her family, and she felt like no one could capture the essence of both her mother and the Catholic worker. So I think she had just kind of given up. Well, anyway, she died. She died in 2008, and um, you know, I mourned for a year, and then, then the diaries came out, my grandmother's diaries that, that Robert um, edited, and it was something. Um, I read that book, and it is a big, bloody book. Okay. I read that book in, I think, five days. I could not put it down. It was like it had just opened up this floodgate of emotion. And I thought, I have to do this. I have to write this tale. If I don't write it, this is a story. I mean, the, the, the most basic element of my grandmother that the people were not talking about, or certainly I didn't see them talking about, was the fact that it was the birth of my mother who led to her conversion. The reason why we know Dorothy Day as she is and what she did happened with the birth of, that, of my mother. And there was no, you know, other than kind of like, well, how could she be a good mother doing the things she did? There was no other discussion about who she was as a mother, who she was as a grandmother. So I decided I had to do this. And it took me five years, <laughs> but I did it. Um, anyway, I just would, would like to, to read a few segments from it um, to give you an idea. Um, I'm starting off with this, this short story about Mary House, which I love, and, uh, and uh, it kind of lightens up the uh, atmosphere of it. I absolutely adore Mary House. I was 15 when I first visited the Catholic worker in New York City with a group of friends from school. A man began throwing rocks at us a block away from the house, St. Joseph's on East First Street, and we fled. It was 1975, and the city, worn, filthy, and bleak, was near bankruptcy. The following summer, I showed up at Mary House six months after it opened. And this time I was met at the bus station by Stanley. Everyone needs a guide when entering the wilderness, and it was Stanley who helped me through those first encounters with the Catholic worker city houses. With his Brooklyn accent, receding hairline, broad smile, and round stomach that he would pat gently and say, too much Catholic worker soup. <laughs> I continued to show up for short visits during school breaks, and Lena Rizzo greeted me as she greeted everyone who walked into Mary House. In the summer, she lived in Union Square on the sidewalks between the trash bins and walk signs surrounded by her belongings, which were kept in canvas U.S. postal bags she carried in a supermarket cart. In winter, she lived on the bench in the Mary House foyer. She refused to stay in a room, where she spent her days sewing clothes with large running stitches Garrulous and friendly, she had her own style of language. Is Doris on the microphone, she'd call out, which I learned to interpret as, is Helen on the telephone? <laughs> she asked everyone who passed, got a cigarette? She even asked Mother Teresa of Calcutta when she came to visit. <laughs> no, I'm sorry I don't, Mother Teresa replied. <laughs> To which Lena said the same thing she said to everyone who didn't have a cigarette. Well then, what good are you? <laughs> I'd like to read another short piece um, that I call, I just refer to as sainthood. After Tamar died and we were going through her, lit, her things, choosing which treasures we each wanted to keep, my sister Becky said, everything she had was broken. Every piece of Tamar's belongings had some damage, furniture, dishes, vases, even the ceramic fish she used as a spoon holder on the stove. Becky sounded sad as she said this, as if Tamar felt she didn't deserve to have things that weren't broken. But maybe she was drawn to all things broken. Creatures, teenagers, ceramic fish, wanting to help heal them, help make them whole. 
Maybe she saw beauty in the cracked, chipped, and repaired. This is the paradox we all live with, this flawed vessel called to holiness. Dorothy said, what a variety of people called to be saints, crotchety, giddy, cranky ones, bibulous ones. Stanley said, people come to the worker expecting to find saints, and instead, they find human beings. Tamar said, everybody wants the other person to be a saint. <laughs> she also once, with a slip of the tongue, referred to Dorothy as being tried for sainthood. <laughs> Do you believe your mother is a saint? I asked Tamar during her last year. She, su she surprised me, not that she answered. That would never have happened. But there was no dismissive flick of the hand, no vague shrug. Instead, her eyes lit up, and she laughed. In that last decade, when Tamar got back in touch with some of the old crowd, going back to the 1930s, one of the men who had lived at the Easton Farm, that was one of the, the first farm that the Catholic group had in Pennsylvania, who lived at the Easton Farm, said to her, Dorothy was no saint. She laughed then, too, and didn't disagree. But neither did she agree. Again, she kept her own counsel. Tamar, ever practical and sensible, said the miracle of Dorothy's life is the Catholic worker, this modern-day parable of the loaves and fishes, and the church doesn't need to look any further. What riches she spread about her like St. Bridget's cloak, the one Bridget would hang on a sunbeam, and which, when she spread it out on the ground, grew and grew until it covered the countryside, a glint of silver running along its edge as it brought abundance and beauty everywhere it touched. That's the miracle. That cloak spread out to give comfort and shelter to our most wounded in body and soul as Dorothy handed out riches recklessly and with abandon to whomever she met. There are many eyes on Dorothy, those who knew her, those who didn't but looked to her for answers, and those, friendly or hostile, who searched her every action and word to support what they already believe. And those who examine her for possible canonization. Sometimes I feel their presence, too, searching just as intently. There are many ways to dis dismiss Dorothy Day, to, to distort her, or call her a dingbat, or a communist or to say she was obsessed with medieval notions of sanctity, or call her a social worker, social activist, a humble woman, when she was so much more. But perhaps we all have it wrong. It is not us who should be casting our eyes on Dorothy, but we should be feeling her eyes on us. Both Tamar and Dorothy stare at me from the photos I have of them above my desk, like old Italian portraits in which the eyes of the subject follow me around the room. <coughs> There is Tamar in her 50s, soon after Dorothy's death, in which she is looking into the camera. And every time I sit down to write, I have to meet her intimate yet cool gaze. Next to that photo is Dorothy in her early 40s, her hair already white. She looks off to the side, so I cannot meet her gaze. And then there is the photo Richard Avedon took in 1969. She is older, her hair is a bit untidy. And there is still some indefinable energy beneath the surface of her aged face. Her eyes know what they see, and they look straight into mine. The photos make other people uncomfortable. Shaman's eyes, one visitor to my home said. Unsettling, said another. I feel defensive. Don't they see what I see? Don't they see that this is a strength of a kind they may never see again? Dorothy is in danger of being lost in all her wild and varied ways, her complexities, her contradictions, and the sense of power that defies description. The look, as Tamar described it, with those beautiful and devastating eyes, darting and intense. Her voice, the one she has left for us, is beautiful, simple, and evocative. But then sometimes there is a lecturing, the defensiveness, and the piety. Often it feels as if she, tried, to, she hard, tried hard to efface herself. This was partly for good reasons. She was fierce, dictatorial, 
controlling, judgmental, and often angry. And she knew it. It took the Catholic worker, her own creation, to teach her her lessons. In my struggles to know the nature of her gifts, I hold on to my relics of her. I hoard my beliefs, my stories, my memories, and those things I have like her marked copy of the imitation of Christ and the hand-woven Bolivian bag she wore when arrested for the last time at the age of 75. Others, too, hold on for dear life to their Dorothy stories, their Dorothy connection, their Dorothy relics. Stop it, she says. Look to yourselves. Do the work. But what is the work? Dorothy never said that everyone should work on the soup line. She loved people's vocations and occupations and found so much beauty in our desire to work and create. I suspect she became exhausted by what people said she did or didn't approve of. And her own attempts to direct and control often backfired. When she was 79, she said, I feel like an utter failure. And she warned us that we always must expect failure. The older I get, the more I feel that faithfulness and perseverance are the greatest virtues, accepting the sense of failure we all must have in our work, in the work of others around us, since Christ was the world's greatest failure. Still, she said, we must keep moving. Take as many steps as you can, bear witness, bear witness stand fast, huddle together in faith and community, and dream. We have, she said, a responsibility to hope and to dream of a better world. And being a practical mystic, she said one spiritual life takes at least three hours a day. It has been said that three things kept Dorothy going, prayer, the sacraments, in particular the Eucharist, and the works of mercy. Why isn't the word love mentioned here? We don't talk much about how she loved, including Lionel. Lionel was the, her first love, with whom she had an abortion. And then Foster, her daughter, and on and on, this ever-widening circle of family sheltered under her cloak of love. Always, always, Dorothy spoke and wrote of love. As she said, there is no end to the folly of love, and there is nothing else to write about. In the end, her enlarged heart gave out from the strain. Maybe it was the outcome of having had so many demands on her, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. But I can't see her having it any other way. The miracle was how long she was able to live with it, the love that kept her alive. Christ understands us when we fail, she said, and God understands us when we try to love. Thank you. I didn't really talk about my father. Um, you know, I, I apologize for not talking about my father, but that is a whole nother story. That um, it's a very difficult story, um, and it would take quite a while. Um, my father was a very interesting man, um, and he and my mother met at the Easton Farm, the first um, Catholic worker farm. Um, he was very much um, in support of the distributists. You know that was the kind of the the, um, the English Catholic back to the land movement. Of, um, it was supposed to be an alternative to capitalism and communism, and that was his his real interest. Um, he 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 lived a very hard life. He struggled with a, a lot of problems, and um, the marriage did not last beyond. Um, my birth, um, though my parents never got divorced, but um, they separated 
after I was born. Um, this, this brings a whole other element to which I did not talk about, which was why my mother left the church. Um, and, um, <laughs> well, I mean, it's in the book, so it's not as if I'm not revealing anything that's not already in the book. It's just that I don't want to, I don't want to just kind of rush over it. Um, it's a pretty complicated story, so, uh, you know, um, but it, 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 it uh, opened an element for my mother that um, made it really hard for her to stay in the church. So, um, I, I, I can only say, um, read the book. <laughs> I thought your book was really astounding. And Thank you. One of the most fascinating parts of it to me was the treatment of your father. So uh, I just echo what you said. And uh, it was really, uh, I felt like the old saying about uh, take your shoes off for the, uh, the space you tread on is holy. And I think you really made it holy for us. Um, just if I may pick up on a, a point that you made, uh, I happened to be in the palestra uh, during the Eucharistic Congress on the day that your grandmother shared the stage with Mother Teresa uh, and Eileen Egan. Uh, and uh, there were 16,500 people there. Uh, and I don't think she ended up talking about what she intended to because although the day was billed as Ladies' Day, it turned out that when folks showed up, it also was piggybacked as Armed Forces Day. <laughs> and it also was Wednesday of the week, which happened to be the 6th of August, which happened to be Hiroshima Day, and the Feast of the Transfiguration. So my recollection is that your grandmother went last, and she probably was already in the early stages of congestive heart failure, and had a heart attack soon afterwards. Uh, so it was very hard to hear her speak over, over the public address system, uh, but she was as tenacious as you would expect her to be in uh, her critique of the military industrial complex and uh, uh, US foreign policy uh, and the arms race, which of course at that time was really uh, accelerating in terms of nuclear arms, as, as it is again now. Uh, so she was very powerful even though in a very debilitated state uh, at that point in her life. And uh, uh, in a very prophetic way, she challenged the whole structure on the event. And uh, I thought it was quite fascinating having had the privilege to be there uh, with uh, 16,499 <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask you a quick question, which does kind of build on, on uh, the question of, of your father. I know that uh, from reading your book that your mom wanted to get married at 16 and your grandmother made her promise to wait until she was 18. And in the meantime, uh, if I have the chronology right, uh, your grandmother took a sabbatical from the worker and went to live in a former convent building in Farmville while your mom went to uh, uh, get some practical ag and tech training at the uh, SUNY College in Farmingdale, Long Island. And then uh, later on, I think she got some more shall we say, aesthetic training by going to study in the studio of Eddie Bethune. Uh, it's that went before. Okay, so but yeah. there's a Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire connection too. Around. So, yeah, so I'm just curious if you can comment on the, uh, the practical side that your grandmother intended for your mother and the, the more poetic, aesthetic side in her ongoing education <coughs> and formation and her vocation. So you mean the, the, what was my grandmother trying to achieve? And yeah, by sending her to Farmingdale and before that sending her to uh, Portsmouth yeah. to study under Addy Bethune. Um, well, as with everything, there, there's a, a lot of threads to this. Um, she was absolutely horrified that my mother wanted to get married at the age of 16. Um, and she did make my mother promise that she wouldn't get married until she turned 18. 
And so part of that, um, she was hoping to kind of convince my mother to change her mind about the marriage. And so um, she first sent her up to Adi with whom Adi was running this uh, apprenticeship program for young women. Um, Adi knew my mother. When Adi first appeared at um, the Catholic Worker in Manhattan in 1933 or 1934, I think it was 1934. And um, so she knew my, my mother since she was uh, nine years old and um, spent a lot of time with my, with my mom. They, my mother absolutely adored Adi. She was one of those aunties. And, and so my mother had spent quite a bit of time with her, and so it seemed like a logical extension to, okay, get her away from the Eastern Farm, get her away from the influence of my father, send her off to Adi's, a place that, you know, a person that she loved. And my mother had one of the best years of her life there. It really, I mean, it, it, I think she was the happiest she'd ever been. But a series of events happened, um, one of which, um, you know, my mother and grandmother had, as I mentioned, a very intense relationship, and um, they were very close, and it was hard for both of them to be apart. And also, um, as my mother grew more attached to Adi Bethune and Adi's mother, her Adi's own mother, um, my grandmother, uh, well, my mother just came out and said it. Dorothy was jealous. <laughs> she said she had a jealous streak in her, just like her sister Della. Um, and, and, but that's just one element of it. I think that, that that was one aspect. Another aspect was that Adi actually got very ill that year and she had to close the school. Um, another thing that happened is that Adi had some very strong ideas. My mother had dropped out of high school um, and uh, Adi felt that she needed to return to high school. And um, at that time, um, she really wasn't prepared. She had to go back for more, cl for more classes. And my grandmother just didn't feel education was that important. Um, her brothers all dropped out of high school when they were 15 and became, went on to become very well respected and very well educated, you know, self educated journalists. And, you know, she, well, she finished high school and she did two years of university, but she never felt it was important. This is very hard for my mother because on the foster side of the family, they all were hugely, highly well-educated men and women. Um, you know, some of her some of her aunts were the first women to graduate with master's degree in mathematics from the universities that they went to. Um, so she had this, and she really wanted to 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 test her academic skills because she always. Um, this is a long-winded answer to your question, but it's a long story. <laughs> um, my mother was odd, is one way of putting it. She was slow to develop, and now I think we would recognize, or certainly she recognized herself, that she was probably on the spectrum of Asperger's. Um, she was very slow to kind of to to become engaged with people. She had no social skills whatsoever, and my my mother, my grandmother didn't. I mean, at that time, that wasn't talked about. You know, you either wasn't. You know, thrived in academia, you didn't. And you went to trade school, those are the two options. Well, it turns out that my mother was indeed extremely intelligent. Um, she just worked in a different way, and she always felt like she was being dismissed for her intelligence. So she agreed with Adi, get me back to um, high school, let me pass my New York Regents exam, get me into college. And um, and my grandmother just didn't see the importance of that. Um, and, and, but anyway, my mother did eventually win and she went to Farmingdale Ag School. Um, but by that time, I think, it's so complicated, isn't it? People are so complicated. Um, she was still determined to get married. So, but she was also determined to show her mother that she could do the academics. And she, she did her first term at ag school. She did brilliantly. And, and listen, you know, remember, she didn't have a completed high school education. She was studying at the college level with only doing one year of high school. Wow. So there was nothing wrong with her mind. Um, and she really, she felt so good about proving this to her mom. But she also wanted to get married. So she, at the, the term, term ended, and then she turned 18. And so she quit high school and she went and married my father. 
Now, in terms of the uh, kind of a larger analysis of that, I can't give you anyone. You know, this is something that my mother chewed on for the rest of her life. You know, what could have happened if some, you know, just one little step in a different direction, one one way that she would have been, she felt that her vocation. And at that time, and I didn't know this, at the, uh, since she was a young woman, she wanted to be a doctor. Um, and I didn't find this out until after her death. But um, that, that is really what, what her call, she felt her vocation was. Um, and so she never, she was never able to work that out, the fact that she, she was never able to follow through, through her vocation, which is why it was so strong, you know, in her mind for us kids. So that, that's all I can really, you know, give to you for that. I may ask a quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, your mother sort of laughed off the comment that somebody made that she was no saint or when somebody else asked was she a saint. And I seem to recall I worked in the, in the 90s for the Croatians who had started a grassroots campaign for canonization that your mother had let them know that she was not in favor of them doing that. So I was just wondering if you had any other comments on the family's evolution of you know this whole participation in the canonization well first i would be very surprised if she came out and said she was not in favor of it um, that really was not her way um but i don't know maybe she did um she never certainly said that to me and she never said it to anyone else i think that from her point of view it just wasn't her call it wasn't her you know that wasn't her business um you know if someone's, uh, uh, you know, that was the church's business. That was um, just not, it's not up to the family, you know. Um, and I agree with her, actually. You know, I think we're too close. Um, our pri our primarily, primary, primary relationship with her is, you know, grandmother, grandchildren, um, with my mom, you know, mother and child. Um, that said, of course, everyone always has an opinion. <laughs> um, you know, I can't speak for anyone else in my family. We are an incredibly diverse group of people with diverse experience of my grandmother because of the, the, the difference of age, age range. So certainly, you know, what I believe is not going to be what um, any, anyone else is going to believe in my family. And I really had to make that clear when I wrote this book. I said to my siblings, you know, I can only write from my point of view. I can't include your opinions or your experience. You know, if you want that, you'll have to write your own book. Um, you know, that said, I'll speak for myself, and that is I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that she's a saint. Um, and what that is, I really can't tell you. I mean, I think I have these kind of vague notions, but I think, you know, they kind of center around that that this kind of holiness helps us change our perception of the world, um, that we see the world very narrowly, and saints change that. And, and I believe certainly that she does that. And also I've experienced my own you know, experiences with her um, that, that I feel that there's something going on there that I cannot find. Uh, Kate, when you said uh, pray and pray a lot, it meant a lot, but then you added wistfully, why do we pray? And that recalled for me my experience with Father Carroll Stillmuller in Chicago. He taught us the, uh, the, the Psalms, and he said, uh, why do we pray? We don't pray because prayer changes anything. He said, we pray because prayer keeps us face to face with God. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, that was very nice. Uh, I've enjoyed these, uh, this uh, opportunity to hear you talk. The workers, I, I worked in Chile for 50 years, or just sat there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the suffering of workers in South America is so great. Do you have any contact with people in Latin America uh, to form a Catholic uh, workers organization so that they will be able to suffer through and, and uh, English, 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 suffer through 
and uh, make their situation better? Do you have any contact with South America? Or? I don't. No, I'm not the person to ask. I, you know, Marsh, do you know who would be the person to talk to? There's there someone. is a, a mayor in all missioner who has a Catholic worker house in San Salvador. And in Guatemala as well. Started by a married old priest that has since died, but it's still an active Catholic worker house. In Mexico has one. Mexico City. Any in South America? I guess that's something we need to find out. <laughs> Peru. Lima. Yeah, I don't know who would be the person to, to find all this out. I, I don't really don't know. I think you should go to March. <laughs> she should know. I don't know if this is really a question, but when you were saying about prayer, we had a request. There's a woman who's a very important part of the New York Catholic worker community that is really um, suffering from cancer. And so there's been started a prayer line asking Dorothy to intervene for healing for her. She has a very young daughter. So if everyone here could go home tonight and pray for Heidi and ask Dorothy to intervene in healing for the Holy Spirit and for um, Heidi, that would be amazing. And maybe that will be another one of Dorothy Day's miracles that we can look for. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. I think I see. Oh, there's one more. I just wanted to say thank you for your uh, honesty. And the book was amazing. And to be able to get that glimpse into your life and your mom's life and your grandmother's life and just thank you for sharing that mm. with all of us. It really is very powerful.